Messenger. Hey, Will Sherlin with GutterFightingSecrets.com. Today I'm here with my longtime Sifu and Jeet Kune Do instructor, Brian Carpenter. Quick! He throws a tongue, lots, back fist. Guy throws another punch. He deflects again, chop to the throat. Brian, how are you? Good to be here. Hey, it's good to have you, man. Thank Thanks you for so, coming out. Thank you so much, Will. My honor. Thank you. So, Brian, besides from being a Jeet Kune Do instructor, um, you're also a personal trainer, uh, published physical fitness author, stage actor, uh, film actor, producer. Um, <laughs> dude, I gotta ask you, man, like, when do you find the time? You ever find time to sleep with all the activities that you're doing? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, you know, I, I don't get enough sleep. Um, I, I wish I could get a little more, but uh, being 54 uh, is, is, time is of the essence. So uh, when I had the opportunity to come and be with you, I jumped at the chance. 54, man, and you're still going strong. I'm still, amen. God, God bless, and, and uh, he comes in, boom, talks out, bang, hammer fist to the bridge of the nose. Uh, and, and, uh, with all the, the things I've accomplished in my life, uh, I feel pretty, I feel pretty lucky, pretty pretty blessed, to say the, to say the least. Well, I've got to say, man, we're, we're blessed to have you here, and for you to be able to share some knowledge and wisdom that you've been able to accumulate over the years, you know, not only with me, but also with the younger guys coming up in the martial arts. They're looking around for a system to train in. Um, they're looking at Krav, they're looking at, you know, MMA, they're looking at, you know, Jeet Kune Do, Ninja 2, whatever. Now, there's a lot of great systems out there, obviously. Um, hey, there's a lot of focus on, you know, street fighting, MMA, but not a lot of focusing on, you know, the more e esoteric principles of Eastern martial arts, Eastern philosophy, you know, Bruce Lee was kind of a fountain of knowledge when it came to, um, for example, you always talk about absorb what is useful, rejecting what is useless. Um, yeah. You also talk about, you know, being the artist and that being a martial artist really is no different than, you know, an artist with a canvas and a brush. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, this is something that really fascinates me. Now, um, can you expand on this uh, for the audience at all? Yes, if, if you think about the word artist, it is an artist. If you and I were going to paint a picture, uh, I might use oil on that mm -hmm. canvas, mm -hmm. and you might use watercolor or acrylic. Um, and that's the difference. I mean, what works for you and I as a martial artist, if we had another guy with not the same genetics as us and a little heavier, he might not be able to do the certain things. So you teach him with what's good that will work for him. That artist, is I will see what works for that person. If you can teach someone... And this is Bruce Lee uh, saying this. If you can teach someone uh, a few moves and a few techniques, and they master those techniques, that's a dangerous man. Yeah. You see how fast they come? These are all deflections and strikes. Okay, now what we do is we get to where this would happen in the street. Strike! Oh, there's the bomb sound. Bang into the eyes. He comes in, headbutt, knee strike. At that point, the fight should be over. When you strike somebody with that strike... Which is something that one of my other coaches a long time ago told me when I first started martial arts, as far as you can have a boxer who knows five techniques, for example, and then a martial artist who knows a thousand techniques. And that boxer will crush that martial artist every time, just simply because of the amount of repetitions he's thrown that left hook, whereas the martial artist may know, you know, three different ways to chop somebody, but he's practiced, you know each of those chops a handful of times. Yeah, well that's the problem with a lot of martial artists um, and the, the schools of today. Uh, they're gonna give these black belts out like candy. Yeah. And you know, that's the problem, you know, uh, and they're giving this false security that they know a lot. Yeah. And th this is what drew me to Jeet Kune Do is because it was more well-rounded. He was truly the first MMA martial artist. I agree with that. Um, yeah, he, he took uh, the Western style boxing, the way he danced around, he loved Ali, loved to do that. Um, he didn't lead with his less dominant hand, he led with his dominant hand, Yeah, which is like fencing. Right, exactly. So he, he took what was would work with different martial arts and created his own, and you know, it, it works. I mean, it's... it's it, it, it clearly does work. Um, you know, you've heard guys talk about a lot, um, you've heard guys talk a lot about, especially these days, MMA and um, you know these various Krav Magas and these different fight systems, um, and I'm not necessarily saying is one is better than the other. Although I will you know talk about this as far as 
you know, mixed martial arts is designed for a cage fight, right? It's not designed for the streets where you've got yes. multiple attackers. Um, can you tell us more about, you know, as far as Jeet Kune Do's efficiency versus that whole cage fighting mixed martial arts thing? Well, the cage fighting uh, is a sport, and it's a great sport. And, I, you know, I don't know if I'd want to go in there and do that um, because I'm going to cheat too much. If yeah. the guy takes yeah. me down in Jeet Kune Do, uh, I'm going to go for the eyes. I'm going to go for the throat. I'm going to go for the groin. Um, and I've had wrestlers do that to me and actually challenge me in other gyms. I can, for a second, you know, choke you out. Okay, well, then let's do it. And I do what I need to do and grab them by the throat and their eyes and their crotch. And they're down and they're thinking that's cheating. That's the difference. Theirs is a sport. What we teach and what your style is with your with your fighting uh, techniques is for survival on the street. I don't want to be on the ground because there is multiple attackers. That's exactly it. Um, you're not gonna you know, go ahead and throw a rear naked choke on somebody and then that's it. Generally speaking, you know, you'll go ahead and throw that rear naked choke and then a bottle gets broken over your head from behind. Exactly, you want to make sure that you can see everything around you. Yeah. Using your peripheral vision, trying to get, not being cornered, but have something behind you, a wall, whatever it may be, so that, that person can't sneak up behind you. You know, I talk a lot with my guys about in higher levels of in higher levels of martial arts, not having to resort to you know gouging someone's eye or even kicking someone in the balls, but rather you know defusing their aggression through either you know making them second guess themselves or um, something like that. Like, can you kind of go into more? The higher yeah, level of, yeah. I think um, a lot has to do with what the energy you're giving off, the confidence. Yeah. And, and most of the times, they really don't want to fight. They're calling your bluff. It's kind of like a, a pack of hyenas, yap, yap, yeah, yap, yap. Yap, yap, and you're the lion. The lion just kind of sits there and gives one roar. Yeah. And then they kind of just back up. And the same thing with, with uh, you know, the problems, like I said, being on a subway before. Uh, they're gonna look at you now. You don't want to look away and be scared right. But I'm gonna stare at them for a second and, and give them a look like okay Psychologically, I'm not the guy. Yeah, and I'm ready and now and you might beat me But you'll be in a fight for you know, well that that's yeah. exactly it and you know you were talking about um, You had a great story for us once that about how you were in Was it a, a pharmacy somewhere and a couple of guys came up to you? Oh, yeah, yeah what did you say? You told them, get get an ambulance because well, you're going to need it. Yeah, you know, uh, the guys were drunk, and I really didn't want to hurt them. But we're on a line, and uh, there was two people in front of me, myself, and then these two fellas. And they had a big jug of iced tea, and I could smell the alcohol in it. Mm -hmm. This is in Manhattan, downtown. And uh, the guy was saying a lot of nasty, negative things, mentioned my mother, and a bunch of different things. And I just kept letting it go. But then I felt a little nudge on my back, and I turned around and said, I'm not the guy. And he said, what do you mean? What'd you say? I said, you heard what I said. So when I got to pay for my allergy medicine, I just gave the lady my card. I didn't keep my eye off of them, but I spoke to her and said, listen, do me a favor, call 911. We're gonna have a problem here, and they're gonna need an ambulance. That's great. That's, that's so it made them second guess, because I didn't get loud. I didn't argue, I didn't put my fist up. Um, but I assessed the situation. What can I do? They're drunk. Um, but I did go outside. They didn't cause a problem in the store, but as soon as I got out, I went to the other side of the street and there was a brick wall of another building. I put my back against it and watched them. There was two or three other guys that they met outside. So it was better off I didn't do anything because it was too many of them. And uh, I waited for a while before I got back on my train. Man, that's something I've learned is that there's never just one or two of them. That's, there's always more. That's exactly right. So, like, you seem to have a pretty firm grasp on not only, you know, like I said, the mental warfare, the physical combatives, but also the more esoteric um, Eastern philosophies that I know Bruce had um, that were very essential to his, you know, Tao. Um, Kung Fu has it. Absolutely. Can, you know, can you tell us maybe, like, how do you think these more esoteric, philosophical, uh, spiritual teachings help to forge a warrior? Well, you're the warrior, but you're always battling the demons inside you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So 
the, through our meditation and the breathing techniques that we have done, even when I was teaching you uh, the, the iron palm mm -hmm. technique, we always began and finished with our breathing and our meditating techniques. Uh, that centers you. You know, you look at the, 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 the symbol, the yin and yang, there's a reason that that balance is there. And there's a black dot and a white dot, why? There's good and evil and evil and good in both. Yeah. So, you know, that spiritual side will lessen you to want to escalate a fight. You'll be able to tap into that spiritual side and not gouge somebody out or maim them or kill them because you've tapped into the human side of you and that spiritual side that you don't want to do. Which is, I mean, these days you can't, you can't be too careful as far as Oh no! Hurting someone, especially you know, we're on camera what average of eighteen times a day, something like that. Yes. I don't know the exact um, statistics or anything, but you know, like you said, as far as balance, um, I think it's essential, and I think that that's one thing we learned from studying martial arts. Yes. Uh, I know in the ninjutsu um, philosophies, they they have a kind of a philosophy of staying in the center, and you and I talk a lot about um, exploiting the center line on your opponent, but it can yes. also be used to explain you know you want to walk in between that path of light and dark yeah and I think that that's that's really essential it's very essential and I've, I've talked to people um, and they would ask me wow you know you're, you're such a nice guy when, you, when we get in to a spar a little bit you, your eyes change and you look like you're mad at me and I'm like no but that's the warrior in me there's two sides to the coin yeah oh yeah. the heads and the tails and I've worked on it. As a young kid, I, I had a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of fights, and, and I had to realize as a young man, like, I need to change my ways before I really hurt someone and end up in prison. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you become a man, you, you realize, okay, let me dive into what's causing me to be angry, yeah. the demons. Yeah. And they're there. Well, I mean, everyone has them. Absolutely. Um, you know, I've noticed that as far as serious martial artists, um, go and I'm talking about not someone who goes to Taekwondo twice a week I'm talking about a man that could kill you you know within 10 seconds with his hands yeah those people tend to be the nicest guys I meet <laughs> they're the sweetest guys they, they really, really are. are absolutely without a doubt they have nothing to prove yeah that's exactly they it have nothing to prove they're not insecure and that's what all fear and insecurity in humankind has really caused most of the problems we have I'd be inclined to agree with that yeah. absolutely you know you meet um, like let's say a street brawler or a convict or something like that. And you can tell right away when you look at these guys that you might not want to mess with them too hard, yeah. but you can also kind of tell that like, they don't have that discipline, the self-control. They don't have the control. And I'll use my brother as an example. Um, and he's a sweetheart of a guy. Spent time in prison. He, we grew up very tough, rough life, uh, but he would probably take most of the guys that take some of these classes and kickboxing classes. Uh, he's got that look in his eye. Yeah. It, it, he's been in too many tussles and too many fights. He has nothing to lose. When you look at a man's eyes and he has nothing to lose, that's someone you don't want to mess with. Let it go. Yeah, yeah. You're absolutely right about that. Yeah. Now, talking a little bit briefly about um, street fighters versus martial artists. Uh, let me even throw like cage fighters and soldiers into the mix here. Like, do you think that there is a difference between someone who's grown up fighting and they're tough, and then a martial artist, and then, for example, like a special forces soldier, as far as being a martial artist and being a warrior and maybe a fighter? Um, all of them are, have similarities and, and also have uh, their differences. Uh, a street fighter is, is, is most of the time undisciplined. Uh, there, but they'll be dangerous because they're going to grab whatever it takes and not think of the consequences and hit you in the head with a pipe, a bottle, they stab you with a knife. They don't care about human life. A warrior and a martial artist uh, maybe grew up that way, but learned the discipline not to be this way. Learned how they can defuse the situation without hurting them or killing yeah. them. And you can do that even with a joint lock or whatever. Uh, as a soldier, and you've trained with soldiers, uh, the SEALs, if I remember right, and uh, the Israeli team yeah. out, out yeah, in, the, in uh, Israel. Yeah. IDF, yeah. So I've trained different guys that are U.S. Marshals and you know Marines and stuff, and these guys are trained killers, and yet they still have a heart, and you see that there, there's love and caring in them when they're saving someone. Yeah. So, Like I said, you know, they they're really are the nicest guys, and then 
that might differ slightly from the guys I've met, you know, in TAG and Special Forces and all that. They are nice guys, don't get me wrong. You yeah. can, you can kind of tell, though, when you look in their eyes, um, especially if they've seen some action, that they they maybe have lost a part of them or something like that. Well, when you're looking at war, and that was my next statement, when you're looking at war and you're seeing, you know, uh, limbs blown off and, and things of that nature, uh, that changes a man. Yeah. And I don't know if I'd ever want to see that. I saw a lot of bad things growing up. I don't know if I'd want to see that. Yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, I've, yeah. I've certainly trained and trained and trained as far as taking the action school, but I've never, you know, uh, thank God, I've never had to witness yeah. any of that. Yeah. And that hardens somebody. Yeah. You know, you know I, I've met um, a lot of different guys in my time training who, who have had to deal with that stuff, and I really do think it, it takes a part of you. Yeah, it does, absolutely. I agree. Do you think there's a Bushido, a warrior's code as far as ethics go that, you know, it's kind of an unspoken thing? Uh, yeah, I think there is. Um, you know, they would see me, I would see them, and, and the respect that we'd have, the mutual respect that we would have for one another uh, was an unwritten... I think so, I think so. Law. I mean, yeah. as far as even, you know, traveling overseas, training with different militaries um, and, and groups around the world, there seems to be kind of a mutual, unspoken, unwritten respect between warriors of, of all different ethnicities yeah. and all different classes. Yeah, they, well, I think, you know, even thinking about back when I played sports, uh, college football, they always had, it didn't matter what race, religion, color, right. we were warriors and we were one team. Yeah. So I think when, we're, when you're training with other people or I'm training with other people uh, or with each other, there's that mutual respect that you get um, that is unwritten law of warriors. And even if they battled against each other, it would still be respect. It's like, you know, after the cage fights, um, not always, but sometimes, you know, you'll see them beat the crap out of each other, stand up, one person wins, and then they both pound it at the end. And it's they, like, pound, right, they hug each other, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because they know what it is to be in that, that battle. You know, you're going yeah. into the, the pit, and you're going into the fire with, with someone, so uh, they know what that takes. Now you go and look at some of the people that are terrorists, and they're not nice people. Uh, they have no respect for anything. They have no respect for human life. Nothing. They have no respect for, for their own. For their own life. They're fucking scumbags. You know, so. And which is another reason, you know, I talk about as far as learning. Don't go and learn, you know, um, I don't want to pick on like Taekwondo, but don't go, be careful as far as what you study. Well, they're good, you know, uh, I know some people that, you know, have their children, which is great. It gives sure. them a discipline. You know, they're five, six, seven, eight years old, they're taking Taekwondo. Um, what I teach and what you teach, I can't teach the young kids because they wouldn't be able to control it. That would They're be a gonna, horrible idea, man. Well, that's exactly yeah. right. So they, they, you know, let them learn the karate and the different styles of the taekwondo that they're going to do. And then maybe down the road, they might say, well, look, I want to learn something that's a little more, not just competition. You know? And then I'm not picking on McDojos, but I got my start in a McDojo. Um, you got your start in what? A boxing I gym? I was boxing first, boxing. yeah. In Costello's gym in Patterson. Now, so when you were, all right, so this leads me to another question. You started off in Patterson, which for our viewers around the country, you know, it's not, not the greatest area. Um, no. It's kind of a rough town, right? Very rough town, yeah. So you got your start in a boxing gym in Patterson. I mean, how is that different than someone who, let's say, for example, gets their start in a, you know, karate gym in Beverly Hills, for example? <laughs> Uh, it, you know, I, again, I don't want to uh, cast uh, judgment on anything, but, you know, when you go to a real gym, I mean, we had like Bobby Chez and some professional fighters coming out of Patterson, um, and, you know, I was taking a bus out of Belleville to go to Patterson, uh, and then times going to another place in Newark, which is another rough neighborhood, to, to box. The only thing why I stopped doing it is because they didn't want you to gain weight and lift weights. Mm. So that's kind of what drew me away from it because I really loved it. I loved the sparring. I loved getting the headgear on, going in there and, 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 and fighting with these other young guys. But it was like, you know, you, you can't do weights. You know, you know remember I, I this is in the 70s. Yeah, so. yeah. I hear that a lot as far as, um, like, you know, sometimes in MMA they'll kind of hint at that. They don't necessarily come out and say it because, again, MMA is a little different, but a lot of different, like, well, boxing, for example, they don't want you to lift weights, they don't want you to get big, 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 because it'll um, it'll make you tight, and it'll make you not able to move around. I don't know if I agree with that. I mean, no, no, I definitely don't. Look at Tyson. Yeah. I mean, arguably one of the best heavyweight, if not the best heavyweight ever. Uh, that guy was jacked. He was fast, and he was powerful. You know, power equals speed. 
So you think as long as you're able to move around, as long as you work oh, sure. on your footwork, being big isn't a bad thing. No, absolutely not. I mean, you know, when we say big, we're not talking bodybuilder yeah, yeah. That's two different type of things. But someone that has more muscle, I mean, look at Bruce Lee. He lifted weights. Yeah, he did, didn't he? Most definitely yeah. he did. He lifted weights. He was taking protein powder. Mm. This was in the 60s and 70s, man. Yeah. That's, that's way ahead of his time. By the way, this just leads me to a random question here. Um, what did you guys use for protein powder back then? <laughs> uh, raw eggs. Uh, we would get something called uh, Brewer's Yeast, uh, which they used to make bread. Okay. And uh, we'd throw in some honey. Um, we were looking to watch the fats. They didn't have frozen yogurt. They had something called ice milk, huh. which was a low-fat ice cream, basically. We'd throw that in. Uh, and I was so crazy, I would put the whole shell of the egg in and everything. <laughs> That's nuts. Because of the calcium. So huh. I would put the blender on long enough for it to grind it up and then just drink it as, as best you can. Sounds terrible, man. It was pretty gross. Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking about, you know, today versus yesterday and whatnot. Um, how do you figure that martial arts has changed over the years? Um, I think it's more uh, out there. People know about it. I think, uh, you know, before there wasn't a lot of schools, there wasn't a lot of places to go and learn. Uh, there was a handful, but I think it's been watered down because of that. Yeah, I think so. Um, then again, you know, you can always you can always say that, like when I was growing up as a kid, the thing to study would have been Taekwondo. Like, yeah. so now the thing to study is MMA, right? Everyone wants to do the MMA thing. We are talking about how MMA it's fine, it'll make you a good fighter, but it won't necessarily teach you, you know, those those things that you learn on the streets as far as multiple attackers. And no, uh, and, and nor, nor should it, I guess. Yeah. I mean, they can't do certain things in an MMA fight. You know, it's ultimate fighting. I'm not allowed to do even do a wrist lock. Yeah, you finger. can't, no small joints, no small joints. Like that, yeah. Um, never mind any kind of pressure points or things yeah. that we know, we're not allowed to use that. Um, so for that reason alone, uh, my money would always go with the street fighter uh, trained martial artists like Krav, yourself, Jeet Kune Do, um, because of the vast amount of training you've done and we don't play by rules. You know, something that I've learned a lot about as far as, you know, and I hear this reinforced no matter what system I've been studying, whether it was, you know, Krav or whether it was um, uh, gutter fighting or whether it was, um, uh, wolf's combatives, you know, any any number of these reality systems are going to tell you that um, reinforce time and time again about multiple attackers. Yeah. Not only about multiple attackers, but you know, for example, let's say you get someone down and you're in the grapple with them, and it's only one guy. It's you and this other guy. Like I know the army combatives is huge on uh, BJJ right now. Mm -hmm. So you know, you'll be in the grapple with these guys, and you'll be wrestling around where all you really need to do is you know, take out a knife when they're not looking and they're busy trying to wrap your head up and stab them in the gut several, several times. Yeah, yeah. So you know, it, it really, you have to be not only training about how to fight, but also training about how to think and how does a criminal or a terrorist or someone who's been on the street trying to survive think. That's the biggest thing um, that most people don't understand. It is that criminal's mind. Um, yeah. Even myself, and I've talked to you about this, you know, there's times you're in a city, and even in Manhattan, there's trees that are planted in certain streets. There's little potholders and things that, you know, have plants and there's dirt in there. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna grab with a handful of dirt and it's going in their eyes. If they're coming out to me and there's multiple attackers, the closest one's getting the dirt in the eye. Yeah. So that's going to disable them. Even for a second, I can worry about the next guy. And that's something I love, man, the dirt in the eye. That, that's It's, uh, <laughs> no school's gonna teach that. Well, not only does no one teach it, and you're right, no one does, because I've been traveling around, I, I haven't heard anyone really talk about that, but you don't need any training to throw dirt in a motherfucker's eye. You know, and you throw it in, you, you can have your way. It's like a finger jab. Yeah. You know, most people, you're not gonna teach that in, in other martial arts. You can't. You, you can't, and I mean. Look, I, talk, I listened to one of your videos that you already have out, well, and you talked about that, you know, even when you do fight someone, you take that eye out, they gotta be careful there's, someone's gonna sue you, 
you know, what are they, you know, they're not going to be able to see again if you take that eye out. It's no joke. It's no joke. You've got to be careful as far as what techniques you use when. Well, that's, that's what I'm saying. You know, a woman, I remember a story, a woman was, uh, around the holidays, was getting into a car, and a fellow got up behind her, and she was trained. I forget what style, but she was trained. She turned around, she broke his nose, and, and, and blew his knee out. He went down to the ground. She actually got in trouble for using too much force which is mind-boggling to me. But this is New Jersey, and the rules are, are kind of a bit messed up. Now, welcome to New Jersey, you're under arrest, right? Yeah. Yeah, but you know, there it is important, and I always tell guys this, that you have to kind of use that force continuum as far as you mm -hmm. know what, what better, easier said than done, I think. Yeah. Um, now, we're talking about, you know, how it's changed, and as far as, you know, what, what to kind of look for in not only a system but also a teacher like who is your teacher man like who what is your lineage good question um i learned from a guy by the name of rob fulford before his teacher was a man by the name of vanderbilt vanderbilt was way up north jersey almost near pennsylvania i went to his school a few times because he taught my seafood to be a seafood, but he had to make sure he was teaching it properly. Mm -hmm. So I had to go there and actually show my stuff on the Wing Chun dummy, my stance. I had to spar a couple of guys. For him, his seafood to say, you're doing a great job with him, continue. Mm -hmm. Now, the guy Vanderbilt, he learned from Danny on Santos. And Danny on Santos learned from Bruce Lee. So I know my lineage, how it came down. Yeah. So that was important to me. Um, one of the girls that uh, I train once in a while, I train her mother as well, uh, she started taking a Krav class. Um, the thing she showed me was more like a kickboxing class. They were wearing gloves, uh, they jumped on a dummy and punched it a few times and she was doing, you know, left, right hook, you know, roundhouse kick. Uh, I know that's not Krav. And, um, but that's what the guy's calling it. So it's important to know what you're getting involved in. The average person does it. You know, that's another good point you bring up there as far as I've seen a lot of schools where they'll have you go on the heavy bag and they'll have you kind of mess around with, you know, uh, kick shields and everything, left, right, left, right. In no way does that really prepare you for a fight. No. I mean, what when you and I sit down and train, you know, what we're doing is trapping, we're doing knife work, we're doing yeah. stressful, we're putting ourselves under stress so that when we get into that environment, we're we're going to perform better than just, uh, you know, I've hit a bag, so I know how to hit. Unless you get hit, yeah. you don't know what it's like. And most people have never been hit, including people that have been in Taekwondo and different because they're not allowed to hit to the face. Mm -hmm. Even when they spar, they wear this thing with three little dots on it, and that's where they're allowed to strike. They're not allowed to strike. They get points taken away if they hit them in the head. So, I mean, that's not going to help you in the street. I mean, uh, it's just not. It, once once you get hit in the jaw, everything changes from there. Your Absolutely. plane goes out the window. Well, listen, uh, I, I don't know if you remember this. I'm sure you do. Uh, I had a friend of mine who's in the UFC, Richie. Oh, yeah. And Richie's the real deal. Richie Anino is the real, that guy was on major TV. And you, did, you held your own with him. And he's my height and 225 pounds. And you did really well with him. And he was impressed. And, and he liked what you were doing. You weren't afraid. And he lumped you up a little bit. And I said, well, maybe we better put the gloves on. Uh, but you have no fear for that, and that's important. Other people I've trained or tried to, they would come, and it really didn't fit with me because they weren't used to that. You know, I've seen a lot of people, a lot of people come and go in martial arts. You'll see yeah. them for a couple of months, maybe a couple of weeks, maybe even a year. All of a sudden, they'll drop off. You'll either never see them again. You'll rarely see them. Yeah. You know, what What does it take to really hang in there and not only learn something, but become a competent professional as far as... Well, we talked about it before. It's the generation. I studied for 20 years with my guy almost. So everything's quick fix. I can get on my smartphone and I can find out any information I want. I'll look at a video of now and I had to do right, knife fighting. Right, right. Uh, I don't think so. Everyone wants to believe it's like the Matrix where now I know, you know, Kung Fu. No. no. Not, not by a long shot, no. So, all right, man, something people really want to know about these days especially is um, like dealing with weapons. Um, 
not only how to utilize the weapons properly, which is something that, you know, when I first came to you, um, you asked me to show you how I hold a knife, you know, and I did it like this, the Marine Corps way. And you kind of corrected me, and you said, well, that's fine, but, you know, if you will go ahead and put the knife out like this, you get better reach, you get better distance. Yeah. Now, when it comes to dealing with um, edge weapons, which is something, you know, I have a little of experience with because um, in one of the systems that I was just training in overseas, we used real knives. And I got cut, man, and it, once you get cut, it's, it's totally different. Um, big difference. Yeah, yeah big difference. Um, I did study with a guy once, uh, it was a group of different martial arts, we did use real, real knives. Um, I did not get cut, but someone put his hand up and he had to get rushed mm -hmm. to the hospital because he put his hand up when he shouldn't have. And he, that wasn't the move that the, the instructor was teaching him. And I mean, he's yeah. lucky he didn't get his fingers cut off. Yeah. Uh, but, but knife fighting, look, uh, I teach it, we've done it, and I tell people if someone knows how to use a knife and they pull it on you, give them anything they want, unless, you, like we talked about, getting in a car. Uh, because three things will happen. One, you're gonna take the knife away, highly unlikely. You're gonna get cut, or you're gonna die. And two out of the three aren't good. Yeah. Um, you know, if I am cutting a bagel and I accidentally cut my finger, like, oh my God, I cut my finger, it really hurts. That's not me taking a knife and deliberately, you know, cutting you. Yeah. Like someone says, well, you know, well, you're, you're not stabbing him in the heart, I don't have to do that. And there's, there's arteries and yeah. stuff that I know where to strike that knife, it's not gonna come at you this or like this. It doesn't work that way, you know? Now is there, I mean, do you have a rule of thumb as far as who you'll teach um, knife fighting and? There's a handful of people I've taught. Um, a lot of people, when I did teach a smaller class, it was really to get them in shape. They would spar, they would do things. But for me, uh, and I don't have uh, a system where there's no belts. I mean, you could do there's no belts. I mean, you have different, you know, levels, but, uh, for yourself, right away, I knew you had training, and I wanted to train you with that. I can count on one hand the people I showed Iron Palm. It's something that you have to train year after year after year after year after year before you get to use and, and learn that. Now, do you think that someone who comes to you with training rather than someone who comes with nothing, now, who would you prefer to train? I've heard some, some guys say they prefer to train someone with nothing. I've heard other guys say, I personally prefer to train someone with something. I, I like to train someone with some, some form of, of, of training, whether it be you know, martial arts, boxing, um, because they've been taught. Yeah. So they're used to being taught. Uh, and they have probably have some type of athletic ability to learn mm -hmm. uh, what we're gonna teach them. Um, but when it comes to uh, the weapons and stuff, or Iron Palm, I look at the demeanor of the person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, one guy said, I'd love to be able to break bricks like you do. I can crush guys' heads. <laughs> well, I, in my mind, already you, you told me the answer, I can never teach you that. Yeah. Because that's not what this is about. It's not about that. I mean, you're conditioning your hand, but hopefully you never have to use it. Well, it goes back to that esoteric, you know, Eastern philosophy we're talking about. Um, as far as, you know, I guess you could call it like the sophisticated warrior or the, you know, the professional warrior. The peaceful or the peaceful warrior. Absolutely. Absolutely. Someone who, yeah, they may be highly efficient in killing, that's the last thing they want to do. Absolutely. You don't want to take, I don't know, I, I, I've had fights even younger, uh, and you break someone's nose, and afterwards I feel like, wow, that was pretty messed up, I did that. Yeah. You, you know, you have a heart, that, that spirit comes in, you're like, could I have not done that? Um, so... As you get older and then you're stronger and, and now you know things that can kill somebody, I wouldn't want that on my conscience taking someone's life. Yeah. Unless I they're gonna take my family's life or couldn't have my kid or something crazy, then then you know, you're gonna do what you need to do. We're talking about, you know, what really is the essence of martial arts, right? It's the art of war, um, the art of killing. Um, so I don't know if people really generally take the time enough to think about, well, what am I actually preparing to do here, right? Like, yeah. you're preparing to end a human's life, and that's something you need to take into account when you are training with people. Absolutely. Now, you know, it's funny, you just popped something in my head. Uh, uh, most people, I, I don't want to do martial arts, I want to do Tai Chi, I want to do those beautiful movements, and those are all blocks and strikes. Yeah, they are. But most people don't know that. 
Well, you know, I mean, most people will kind of think about um, China or whatever, Japan, and they, they think of the beautiful lotus flowers and the, yeah. you know, the, the burning incense and all these, and they're beautiful things, don't get me wrong, it's the, these things. It's amazing, absolutely. These cultural things, I've come to love them from studying martial arts and, and going over that way. Um, but when it comes down to it, like in ancient Japan and feudalism, and it, it wasn't a pretty thing. No, it wasn't. No, and and the weapons that they made, they were ahead of their time. I mean, they invented gunpowder. Most people don't even know yeah. that. Um, so they had you, firearms before we did, didn't they? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. We we perfected them better, but they had them, uh, and it was all for fighting. And it was who was conquering who. Japan wanted to conquer China. Canada, and they're fighting back, and you know, and that's pretty much uh, you know they they studied the arts, but. Um, it was for war. It's exactly what it was yeah. designed for. Yeah, and I think that really the essence of martial arts, you know, especially in cage fighting or whatnot, kind of gets lost. Um, I know a lot of different, you know, I've, I've asked around as far as a lot of uh, ninjutsu teachers out there, and these guys won't teach, you know, certain things. Like, they won't teach the art of poisoning, which is part of ninjutsu. They won't teach, you know, yeah. the art of removing centuries because they got to be careful. They got to cover their ass. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You were talking about you don't want to necessarily train someone with the wrong demeanor. Um, Absolutely. So I'm guessing if someone comes, you know, with a shamag on and um, <laughs> you know a C4 thing on their chest, you're not going to train these. No, guys. absolutely not. Um, no. Um, and again, if someone comes, you know, with gang tattoos on their face, that might be another disqualifier for who you, you know, who you allow to. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It just is what it is because, you know, what we do is, is in my opinion, is is. I'm honored that I did get taught this. Mm -hmm. And I'm also humbled and honored that I can teach someone else, knowing that they're not gonna take this and misuse it. Yeah. So it's my it's a responsibility as a human and as a teacher to teach the right people. Right, so Brian, you always stress simplicity when we train. Um, what do you think the advantage would be to keeping your technique simple and short and sweet rather than fancy, flashy, all these? Well, the fancy and flashy is great for the movies and yeah. film and, and stuff like that. It looks great. Um, but high spinning heel kicks and all that kind of stuff will not work in the no, street. No, never um, will. You know, you want to keep, uh, if there's an altercation, you want it over quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, f from finger jabs to, uh, you know, blowing the knee out. I mean, there's, what, eight, ten pounds of pressure that that knee is going to go. And that's what you want to do. Uh, and you can walk away. And granted, he's going to have a, a, a you know meniscus tear, whatever he's going to have, but you can walk away, and that that could be the end of the fight. Well, fuck him anyways for yeah, bothering you. You know, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So, so um, yeah, I think short and sweet and direct is the best way. Uh, and and Jeet Kune Do is what well, fist. intercepting the way of the intercepting fist. Exactly. exactly. So, I mean, we talk a lot about you know in gutter fighting about um, using your. <clears throat> Your enemy's natural reactions against him so in other words like we were talking about the knife fighting um, when you do go ahead and get cut by that knife there's ah shit I just got cut and you talk about that as well um, when okay bam you got you got him in the eye right like oh, shit my eye and then bam 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 you can get him a million other times yeah, things if you want to do it's all about you know some systems talk about creating that pain compliance or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I know as far as in Chi Kune Do, you always stress, get him once or twice before you go for the takedown. Um, can you kind of tell us a little bit more about the philosophy as far as like, so the question was asked the other day, um, I was in the room and somebody was asking you, hey, do does Chi Kune Do have any offensive techniques rather than just defensive techniques? Well, the offense is um, pretty much the same as the defense. Um, I if think that, that makes sense. I think that I understand what you're saying to be something that we talk about and I have talked about with you as far as uh, solid defense is, is a solid offense. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you're going to take that person's energy and use it against them. And once you strike them, and again, I like to use open, open hand even more than a fist. Yeah. It's, it's faster. Uh, it's it's more deadly. I can hit a lot of spots that are that are, are uh, you know debilitating debilitating uh, to that person rather than you know just oh let me go punch him in the head. You know you're, you're more likely breaking a knuckle hitting him in the head rather than you know striking him in the throat. 
That's something Fairburn talked about all the time when it um, came to his gutter fighting system, the original gutter fighting system, is that, um, especially with helmets and all that in the military application, you don't want to go ahead, you'll break your knuckles. You'll break your knuckles, yeah. All that open, open palm. Open palm. Yeah. Eyes. Yeah. Chin jab. Strike to the throat. Those are the things even a guy that, that maybe even is trained as a boxer never felt. Yeah. They never felt that. Um, so that's going to stop them in their tracks. Then an oblique kick to the knee, dropping them to the ground, hammer fisting them to the spine, uh, the back of the neck. Uh, those are all, you know, barbaric but useful techniques and simple that we know. Too. Very simple. Yeah. Remember, when you're training, your heart, you know, is, rate is a certain level. When you get into a real fight, your heart rate's so fast that your fine motor skills are out the window. Oh, yeah. Your gross motor skills are not. Hammer fist, very easy to do. Uh, you know, kick, uh, like a stomp or a knee. It's, it's, it's very easy for someone to do those kind of moves. Yeah, it's funny you talk about the psychology of actually when it, what it feels like when you get into a fight. You know, I know you've experienced it. I've experienced it. It's like your fog comes over you and you, you yeah. just, you do what you've done a thousand million times before and nothing else. That's it. It becomes like breathing. It's yeah. second nature. Uh, so the fine motor skills of a spinning back heel kick and, you know, uh, you know, a different certain block, it's not what's going to happen. And again, though, just to warn people, if you have practiced the spinning back heel kick a thousand million times, you are going to most likely resort to using that. Yeah. But, you know, all the guy needs to do is lean his head back and then fucking kick you over. So Or step into you. Yeah. And then the yeah. heel's over here and does nothing. Yeah. Um, but those, those gross motor skills, listen... If you think about uh, Kung Fu, uh, the tiger, the mm -hmm. the crane, right? What what the, they were animals. They used the animal because an animal doesn't get trained martial art. The tiger just swipes, and his claw is going to go into the eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a hammer fist. You know, a crane is the bird. It's gonna it's gonna do. You know, the praying mantis. Same thing. They're going to use things that nature evolved them to win against other animals absolutely so um, that's what we you know with some of the things you and i do an elbow strike is not something that is, is needs to be uh studied like say a spinning heel kick right you know um you know to bend down and sweep someone off their feet it looks great in the movies like i said it looks awesome but that doesn't work in the real world I mean, that's another thing you can always you can always spot someone who knows what they're doing when they can break it down like this. Like, someone who is so technical and says, well, you need to throw your elbow at 45 degree angle with a you know precise amount of whatever. No, when I train with you, just hit the guy with your elbow. Hit the guy with the elbow. That's Practice it. doing it, but just hit him with your elbow. Yeah. And that's kind of how you know someone knows what they're talking about. Yeah. Just smash the guy. <laughs> exactly. Um, so listen, man, it's been really a pleasure. pleasure no, the pleasure you. is um, all mine. Listen, Thank before you. you go, can you give any advice to um, to young guys out there who are either coming up in the self-defense um, world or even cage fighting, anything, you know, martial artists out there um, for the newer generation coming up? Well, listen, guys, and, and girls, I should say girls as well, because I know they want to study. Um, Follow your teachers, follow your sifus, and, and, and respect them. Learn your art. Really learn it. Uh, make it part of your being. Um, don't just, hey, I want to learn this to fight someone. Go deeper. Go, what Will and I talk about is with the spiritual side of it. Learn to meditate. Learn to go in within. You'll be a better person, and you'll be a better martial artist. And that's yeah, yeah. really what it is all about. And also just smash the guy. <laughs> if need be, smash the guy. Exactly. Uh, how we get in touch with you, man? Uh, listen, uh, they can go through you. I mean, All right. you know, they, they can go through gutter gutter uh, fighting systems, and that's it. I mean, that's you know, gutterfightingsecrets at gmail.com. All right. For if you guys want to go ahead and throw me a message on YouTube in my comment section, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, awesome. I'll get in touch with Brian for you. Uh, he is pretty selective as, as far as who he trains these days, but. Um, We'll go ahead and take care of it that way. That sounds like a plan. Thank right. you. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you. Thank you.